I was just talking to, uh, to Lois about, uh, I heard that she had her, most of her family together on Thanksgiving Day, and I said, did you get the tribe together? And she said, yeah, and then they figured out I had some leftovers, so they came back about 10.30 that night. You know, the best part of uh, Thanksgiving turkey, in my words, in my estimation, the best part of the turkey is the turkey sandwiches that come after you've eaten more than you should have in the middle of the day, but you've got to have something to kind of tide you over through the night. So that's, that's a good thing to have. <clears throat> Ask Jackie to come and lead us. We're going to begin the lighting of the Advent candle today. Sunday of Advent. Today we begin our celebration of Advent. On these four Sundays leading up to Christmas, we will rejoice in the great gift that is ours in Jesus Christ. To help us celebrate, we will be lighting the candles of the Advent wreath. The candles signify that Jesus is the light of the world. The evergreens remind us that he is life and brings life to us. All of these are arranged in a circle because life in Christ has no end. Each Sunday we will light an additional candle. On Christmas Eve we'll light all of them. The center one, the candle, the Christ candle. As we do, we will rejoice that Christ has come to us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. On this first Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of hope. Hope is our assurance that God will finish all he has started. Hope is our confidence that he will do all he has promised. All the promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God and to his indescribable gift. That's 2 Corinthians 9.15. morning, we'd like to have you turn in the Bibles to uh, Galatians chapter 5. We're going to wind up there a little bit later this morning. But I want to uh, give you a little background on the Advent. Uh, Advent, a uh, very simple meaning, <clears throat> it simply means the unveiling. And if you think about the Christmas story, and as you begin reading in Matthew and Luke particularly, <clears throat> you begin to see how God unfolds the coming of the Son. As you come into the book of Mark, you see how God announced Jesus as the Son. He said, this is my Son, and I'm, I'm pleased. I'm pleased with him. I am well pleased. I'm excited about what he's going to do. But we're going to look this morning at some of those people that were around the, uh, the birthing process of Jesus and coming into the world. And so we just want to give you a little bit of a background. Advent means arrival or an entry. The focus of the season is on the birth of Christ, and it's the first advent in anticipation of his coming again. And we'll see today that there was a group of people that were anticipating, expecting, looking, and praying for the coming of Messiah. And so we ought to be looking and praying and anticipating the coming of Jesus as he comes back into the world to take his people with him. And to, Scripture says, for to ever, forever be Pardon me, to meet him in the air and forever to be with him. <clears throat> so this Advent is more than simply marking a 2,000 plus anniversary in history. It's celebrating the truth of God. It's celebrating the revelation of God in Christ. Uh, celebrating that time, recognizing the power of God, the work of God in our lives for his purpose in our lives today. So as we light the Advent candle, we'll be following that theme through the month of December. <clears throat> There are several things around that theme that we'll be looking at, and I have uh, given you a list of some of my message titles for the month of December, and uh, that follows along the Advent candle, and we'll do that from week to week. I encourage you to think with us along that line, pray with us as we worship and celebrate God's presence and power in the weeks and days ahead. 
I want to take you down now to the, uh, the first part of the Gospel as we see it in the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew 1, 18 to 25, we see the messages laid out for us there. And uh, this might be well for us to take a minute and, and, and read that uh, passage. Just I'll read it if you don't just follow along with me. But Matthew uh, chapter 1 verse 18 to 25. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with a child through the Holy Spirit, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from his sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will be with child, will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So as we look at the scripture, we find uh, that uh, God was doing something that nobody seemed to understand. Nobody really seemed to know uh, what was going on. And there's good reason why they did not understand what was going on. It's been 400 years since the last word was heard from God. The last prophet was Malachi. And it's been a 400 year span and there's been no new word from God. And yet there's been a believing remnant through that whole time, looking for and anticipating the coming of Messiah. God sending his son to save the world, to save the, the Jews from the sin that they were living in. And as they look at that, they did not see it so much as their personal sin that he was saving them from. They looked at it as he was going to save them from their enemies all around them. But there were some who were looking explicitly and Jesus, Messiah, they didn't call him Jesus at that time, they called him Messiah, and they were looking forward to Messiah's coming when he would save them from their sin. Now God has always had what we call a believing remnant, and that's a really important uh, note for us to keep in our mind. Throughout all of the history of Israel, there's always been a certain segment of the people that call themselves the people of God, who were really committed to and worshiping and following God. They were astute about their faith. Jump down now to the New Testament times, and there's a group of believers who are really anxiously waiting for and praying for and looking forward to the coming of Messiah. And there are some of those that we want to identify. They all show up pretty clearly in the uh, uh, verses here before us today. But we want to just notice that some of these people that are, are here for us are, are Zechariah, he's a, a, a Jewish priest. Um, we see, not only see Zechariah, but we see um, Mary, we see Joseph, uh, we see um, several people that are believing and looking for and anxiously waiting for the coming of Messiah. They've been, they've been waiting 400 years. People have come, people have gone. And people have said, look for the Messiah, look for the Messiah, look for the Messiah. And many believed that and looked for that and followed him and read the scriptures and recounted the scriptures and studied those scriptures when God had said he would send Messiah to save them from their sin. Now, Isaiah is the one who uh, specifically prophesied about the coming of Messiah. But so did other prophets. Micah was another one that prophesied a lot about the coming of Messiah. There are several prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of Messiah. And prophets spoke, and prophets gave the message, and God was reminding them and saying to them, I'm coming. And he was wanting them to wait, and wait with expectation and interest. So as we see that's taking place, we, we see these people that were really committed to God. They were people who were seriously believing, seriously wanting to display the character of God through their lives, 
they were anxious to do the things that said, I am a God follower. Now we read about Joseph here. We don't understand, and I'm not going to go into the details of it today, but the engagement in the day of Joseph and Mary was uh, equivalent of a marriage today. It was the, the initiation of the marriage, the engagement was there, they were identified as a, a couple, they identified as a husband and wife, but they did not live together for that first year. And then God meets Mary, God meets Zacharias, God meets Elizabeth, God speaks to Anna, God speaks to these shepherds, God speaks to these people who were part of that believing remnant, following after God, believing that he was going to come and that he would be their savior. Now there's some issues here that are interesting to look at. We see Mary coming to that point of this saying, my paraphrase, saying, uh, Messiah is coming. The baby I'm carrying is conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she understood some of the problems that were going to come from that because as she began to show what was happening, she would be identified as an immoral woman because of if she was married, living with her husband, that would be expected. But in this engagement time, it was not expected. But her resolution is, God, I'll leave the details to you. And she did that. She left the details with God. The Advent season is the unveiling of Christ. It's the unveiling of God's work, the unveiling of God coming into this world to be the Savior and take on flesh and blood and live so we could see him and understand him. And he would show us who we are and who he could make us become. Now let's jump from that to where we are today. In those days... It's interesting who was aware of the coming of Messiah and who was not. There were those who were right around the birth of Jesus. There was Joseph, there was Mary, there was Zechariah and Elizabeth, there was Anna. And uh, then as they go to Bethlehem, the, the shepherds come. Now the shepherds are a really interesting people. They were the tenders of the sheep. They were going to be sold as uh, the offerings by the Jewish people as they would come in to worship at the temple. They were shepherding those lambs who were under inspection, watching them to see that they were perfect lambs. And yet their, their job was a lowly job, and they were considered as not even being important. Uh, their testimony didn't hold up in a court of law. They were uh, they they considered untrustworthy. This, uh, they're just kind of, in the minds of most of the people, they're just kind of those old men out there that watched the sheep and lived in the, in the meadows and lived out there with the sheep and took care of them. But there was a group of people who were looking for Messiah to come. Now, isn't it interesting that uh, God was saying to these shepherds, these lambs are going to be symbolic of the Lamb of God that's going to come into the world. And so we find that as they follow that, they're the ones who come to the birth of Jesus. Now, it's interesting to me that the Sanhedrin didn't come. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, they didn't come. They don't seem to have been aware of what was going on. And even when they did learn of what was happening, the birth of Jesus, about a year and a half later, about the same time that the wise men came, the members of the Sanhedrin were also alerted to the fact that Messiah had been born. And they ignored it. They didn't go to see him. They didn't follow him through. And their whole life they spent trying to put the Messiah aside and to ignore him throughout his earthly ministry. They tried to ignore him. Now, ignoring Jesus would be like ignoring uh, the Blazers when they come to town. If you've ever tried to get through city of Portland on a Blazer night, it ain't fun. It's not a fun time. You don't ignore them. Or it would be like ignoring 
when uh, we had some kind of a national disaster. You know, we were living in this area, a great storm came through in 1962, that famous Columbus Day storm. Nobody ignored that. It did a lot of devastation to our area. Nobody ignored that. Jesus coming into the world was creating a big turmoil, and a lot of people were looking at it because the ones who were expecting him, the word spread, and they were looking and watching and praying. But the Pharisees and Sadducees and the scribes and the teachers of the law, the, the ones who said, we have it all, and we're the ones who should be watching, they didn't come. Now, as we look at the, uh, the, the thing here, God was looking for people who were looking for him. And God today, again, is looking for people who are looking for him. I hope you're looking forward to the coming of the Lord. The scripture tells us that there's a day when the angel will blow the trumpet and the dead in Christ will be raised to meet the Lord in the air. And then you and I, who are alive and remain, will meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Are you, are you anxious for the Lord's coming? Are you praying for the Lord's coming? Are you anticipating his coming? Are you living your life in such a way that would say, I want to be recognized as a, a person of God to display the character of God and just to show who he really is. As you think of that, God is looking for those who are looking for him. Now let's go back and look again at some of these people who were uh, supposedly the leaders, but they had a they had a do-it-yourself attitude. See, they also had been watching things for 400 years. Ezra started the uh, the group of teachers and so forth that became the scribes, and they have passed this message on. But in 400 years, nothing has happened, and so they have now drifted around into three ways. I'm going to call it three modes of do it yourself. Number one, some of them said, Messiah hasn't come, so let's do God's job for him. Let's, uh, let's do it through politics. We will work with the Romans. We will deal with the Romans. We will work our way in there where we can be heard, where we can steer political things to come into place for our benefit and to help restore Israel. So we will, we will take care of some of those things in political moves. The second one was, it said, we, we are more like, if we're more like the world, then the world will accept us. And so we find the members of the Jewish leadership that became, in a polite and religious way, became more and more like the world. They began to think and to act like the world. They got involved in political things. They were social activists and to a certain extent. They were uh, trying to control the nation of Israel and get those people to do the things they wanted them to do. And the third thing was, they said that maybe if we can just uh, build enough laws that God will, uh, well, we can show the people who God really is by the laws that they make. Now there are 613 laws that God gave to the Israelite people. We, we think of the Ten Commandments, but there are actually 613 laws that God gave the Jews to live by. And he said, if you will live by those laws, I will be your God, you'll be my people, and uh, you know, that was his plan and that was his purpose. 613. But the time came when the leaders, the spiritual leaders, the so-called spiritual leaders of Israel said, they need some laws to help them remember the laws of God. So they developed another 1,500, maybe afterwards 1,600 laws. And it's been described as having the laws of God in the middle and a fence of the laws of man that were around the laws of God to help them keep that in mind. Now let's just use a very simple um, illustration of that. In the state of Washington, uh, 65 miles an hour is considered to be the, the normal highway speed on a, on a freeway, 65 miles an hour. 
If it's not a freeway, it's probably going to be 60 miles an hour. But they come along every now and then and they drop these little signs that says 60 or 65 or some other speed limit. Now we know, pretty much know, what speed they expect us to drive. The law says this and this and this. But they drop these little lines along here that says this is to remind you. So if you follow this sign, you'll be okay. The Jewish leaders were saying to them, if you'll follow all these lines, then you'll be okay. And these crazy things, they, they were really weird. They had all kinds of things. And to follow Jesus' ministry through his earthly life, you'll notice that the Israelites, from time to time, were saying to Jesus, well, you, you didn't follow our law. What Jesus would do, he would follow the law of God. But they said, but you didn't follow our law. Our law says you don't give that to him here. For example, Jesus healed the man with the withered hand in the synagogue on the Sabbath. And God said you can do things of value to people and for people on the Sabbath. But they said you can't do work on the Sabbath. And so when you heal this man, you're doing the work. And you have broken our law. Jesus never broke the law of God in all of his earthly life, but he did cross the line for some of the Pharisees' laws. He crossed that line often, and they nailed him on it every time they had a chance. So there are three kinds of do-it-yourself that these guys did. One was, we'll do it through politics. One was that we will uh, live more like the world, we'll think like they do, we'll organize like they are, we will uh, pursue the goals that they pursue. We'll do these kinds of things. And the third one was, we will make some rules so that people can know how to stay in line. We who are still waiting and expecting the coming of the Messiah, coming of Jesus, are today in a minority. There's a lot of religion, but there's, a, there's not, a, not a large group of people who are really dedicated, devoted, and committed to God. I think one of the greatest problems in the church today, I'm talking about the American church predominantly, but it's true in other parts of the world too. We're involved in religious activity. We're involved in politics. There are people pounding on our door every day about, if you'll just send some money here, we'll take care of that. We're going to get people back to this morality, back to this morality. We'll protect you here, protect you there, just send us some money. It's kind of a, a household joke in our house. We go out and pick up the mail, and we come in and put it on the counter, and this, the answer is, well, that one wants your money, just send money, just send money, just send money. And the other is that uh, we're just all the time saying, if, if you'll just do this and stand for this and sign this petition and so on. Now I want to back up a little bit and give a little caveat here. I'm not opposed at supporting people and working with people who are trying to represent us for morality and for ethics and who are fighting for us and trying to bring things around. For example, there's a, a group of different people that are doing things through the court system to uh, protect us from uh, abortion. There are others doing things through the court system to uh, allow us to get prayer back in schools and back into the places of government authority and those kind of things. I'm, I'm all for those people. We use all the efforts we can to bring the things that will be beneficial to us as people of God. But let's not become so involved in doing it that way that we forget to do it the way God wants us. Pray and represent righteousness, and live righteousness. I, I was kind of disturbed this week. I found something that was kind of disappointing. No, it was really disappointing. There's a neighborhood in the South King County area called Maple Valley. And uh, one of our church planters started a church out there several years ago. And when he went out there, he worked a little while, and he said, that's the Ford Garage neighborhood. 
not three, but four garage neighborhood. That was his way of saying, that's a wealthy neighborhood. And, and it is a very wealthy neighborhood. Beautiful homes, beautiful estates, um, beautiful landscape. It's a, before the homes were there, it was, even then it was a beautiful landscape area. The reason it's called Maple Valley, the, used to drive through there the fall of the year and the vine maple was absolutely gorgeous. The yellows, the grays, the reds, absolutely gorgeous. And today there's a high population of Christians in that area. But I talked to somebody who works in a coffee shop in that area and is also acquainted with a lot of who these Christians are. And they come into the coffee shop and the barista said they're rude, they talk vulgar, they talk about people, they talk about issues around them in unfruitful ways. And then she said they, they get on the barista because she didn't make the coffee fast enough or didn't make it just right or whatever it is. Now I, I like coffee and I like the fluffy drinks and I like the heavy stuff. And, uh, but I've never quite understood how these baristas can run these machines and and you've got a line of people, and I, I take your order, and she's making that one while she's finishing this one, and she's asking the next one, what can I get for you? And this is going on. And then they've got a, a drive-through window, and somebody's out there. I just don't understand how they keep up with all that. So once in a while, they make a mistake. So she said these people would jump on in a wild way, a crude way, about, you didn't get it right, you didn't get it right, I waited this long, how come I had to wait so long, and so forth. And some of those people that she's hearing say this are Christians. You know, that's shameful. Now, I'm not going to put Maple Valley in the park by themselves, because the same thing's happening to us and around us today. And just take an inventory of our own lives. How often are we so anxious and and upset and devastated and whatever, and we are unkind, we're rude, we're crude, we are using language that's inappropriate, we are doing things that are inappropriate, and then we call ourselves Christians, and we want to invite somebody to come to church with us, and they might back up and say, why should I go to church with you? Because you don't talk any different than I do. And we have allowed ourselves to drift down to in that way, living a lot like the world around us does. It's very similar to what we had in the scribes and Pharisees. They tried to do it politically. They tried to do it economically. They tried to do it by uh, acting like and looking like the other people of the world of that day. They tried to do it with rules and regulations. But God is looking for people who are looking for him looking for people, looking for him. There's a, there's a remnant today. And I want to say this, and it's probably not politically correct, but I still would like to say it, that everybody who attends church is not really committed to God. They're not always committed to God. Number one, there are some people that attend church because they're looking to see what God is like. And they're here because they want to see, they want to know, they want to understand. Some people are coming to church today. I hope I'm making this broad enough to get the point across. Some people are coming to church today because they want somebody else to see them. They want it on their so-called business card. They want it on their resume. They want, when somebody says, oh yeah, I go to that church, that prestigious church. I, I go to this one. I spent several years in the city of Spokane, the prestigious one in that time of St. John's Cathedral. It was a large Episcopalian church up on the South Hill. Gorgeous, beautiful building. Lots of people who were members there. But on Sunday morning, they didn't have much of a crowd. They could seat about 1,500, 2,000 people in this cathedral. And sometimes they'd have a couple hundred. But as you talk to people downtown and try to kind of witness to them something, oh, I go to St. John's. And I wanted to say so many times, uh, when did you go the last time? The guy that was my pastor is growing up. He kind of worked around this. And he said to somebody, well, uh, 
you go to church someplace, oh yeah, I remember such and such. So he changed his question, and he said, instead of what church did you go to, he said, where did you go to church last Sunday? And that, that puts it in a whole different slang of things. All of a sudden, it's, it's out of the general, and it's in the personal. So as we think about that, let's take a new look again. God is looking for those who are looking for him. For example, God is today looking for people who want to keep on learning and keep on studying, and we spend time in scriptures for two reasons. One, we want to know more about God and God's plan for us. We study the scriptures. We try to make them personal. We try to bring them into our life in a very clear and focal way. The second thing we, we do is just spending God time in the presence of God. Just read the scriptures, and as you do, allow yourself to sit in the presence of God and to savvy and to to savor the things of the Word of God and, and pray as you're reading through. And let God speak to your heart. And let God give you an understanding of the Scripture. Let Him give you an understanding of His plan for you, of His plan for the world, of His plan for morality, of His plan for ethics. Spend time in the Scriptures and let God speak to your heart and refresh you. Now, as we think about this, I want to turn your attention these last few minutes to Galatians chapter 5, and uh, starting in verse uh, uh, 15, it said, If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk in the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is controversy to the contrary to the Spirit. Simply put, that says, live like a child of God. Live like the people of God. Live like you had a fellowship with God. You had an intimacy with God. You had a relationship with Him. You were interested in how God wanted you to live. You were interested in how God wants you to act and to think and to work. You were interested in holding an image of righteousness. You were interested in holding uh, a testimony that you are following God, and because you are a follower of God, we do things different than the world does. Instead of fudging on the things and telling white lies and whatever else, we try to be truthful. We try to be honest. <clears throat> we try to be people of integrity. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to do it 100% of the time, but it means that that's your goal, that's your objective, that's your purpose, that's your plan, that's your intention. You're not willing to back away from it. So Jesus, uh, the, the apostle said, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so you are not doing whatever you want. God has given us an opportunity to live a life. And I just want to say again, God is looking for people who are looking for him. A few times over my career as a pastor, I have met people who were visibly looking for God, un unbelieving people, unsaved people, who were visibly looking for God. They were wanting to know who he was, what he did, what he was about. It's, a, it's an important thing for us to ask God to put us in touch with people throughout the day that want to know who God is. You know, engage people in conversation wherever you might be. If you're in a doctor's office, engage people in conversation. If you're in a store, engage people in conversation. If you are in a coffee shop, engage people in conversation. And as you engage them in conversation, see if the Holy Spirit will open a door for you to talk about the gospel. Open the door to talk about God share your testimony with them. Because God has people that he's working with that we don't always know who they are. And so look for those people and let God work in your life and give you an opportunity to share that with, with the people that you see. We can be sure when things are at their worst that God will show up. 
that's what happened when Messiah came. The world at that time, in many ways, was about as tough on Israel as it had been for 400 years. And they said, it's, it's a sinful thing, it's useless. God is not coming. Messiah is not coming. God has put us here for us to build our own world, build our own lifetime, build our own opportunities. And so they started that. They got involved politically, they got involved economically, they got involved by living and acting and working just like the world does, and they got involved in doing things their way, human ways, instead of God's way. Now, today the Christians have unfortunately come to much of that same thing. We're trying to change the world politically. Again, there's not, nothing wrong with, with uh, acting and voting and pursuing and trying to build righteous things and biblical things into the fabric of our society. But that in itself is not going to do it. That coupled with our commitment to God will make some changes around us. People coming to Christ makes a difference. People walking with God makes a difference. God's not interested in the religious chatter that we might have. He's not, not, not interested in the, in the different uh, social activities, if, if they're just religious social activities. God's not so interested in that. What God is really interested in, he's interested in me and you finding a way to live out a life so that when people see us, they identify the fact that we walk with God. So as we think about that today, we can be sure when things are at their worst, now you might say, well, that must be yesterday. Or it was last week. Or it's today. But God knows when they are at their worst. And when they're at their worst, God will down. They send the archangel of the world to come. And he will call those who are dead in Christ. They'll meet him in the air. Then he'll call us and we'll be meeting him in the air. And all of this happens, Scripture tells us, in the, in the twinkling of an eye. Now it doesn't take you very long to blink your eyes. And that's how fast it's going to take place. God has said it would do it. So where are you today? Are you anticipating the Lord's return? Are you looking forward to God's return? And if you are, you're going to be praying for the nation of Israel. You're going to be praying for Jewish people that they would receive Messiah. You're going to be praying that God will protect the nation of Israel. You're going to be praying that God is working to that extent. Because all the stuff that's going on in the world around us today has to do with what God is doing with the nation of Israel. We are kind of a sidebar. As believers, we're kind of a sidebar. We are here at this dispensation. God is wishing and praying and actually working that the Jewish people would come to Christ. That's his plan. And he's going to do it through the nation, and he's going to do it with his people. So we should be, we should be praying for the nation of Israel, praying for Jerusalem, praying for the leadership of Israel, praying for the protection of the nation of Israel. And then praying for Jewish people around the world. There are more Jewish people live outside of the nation of Israel than live in the nation of Israel. So pray for those Jewish people around the world that they might come to know Messiah. They can come to the privilege of knowing Jesus as Messiah, the Savior, the Lamb of God. Because that's the focus that God has. We are kind of a sidebar as Christians. God's working with and for Israel and we are on the blessing side of it today. And we are going to be the ones who will be raised up believers. Doesn't matter if they're Jewish, Jewish believers. Doesn't matter if they're African believers, if they're Russian believers, if they're Asian believers. It, it has no matter what the race or nationality is. He is looking for people around the world who will believe and who do believe and who are seeking and want a relationship with God. That's his plan. That's his purpose. So if you're anxious to see God and be part of the remnant of God today, part of the devoted followers of God today, then the purpose is to give our lives the study of the scripture, give our lives in prayer, give our lives in praying for Israel, praying for Jewish people, 
give our lives and trying to be witnessing to the people around us every day to see them come to know Jesus. Now it doesn't matter where you are. It might mean a secular job. It might mean a spiritual job. It may mean a, a day job, a night job. But how are you living? What are you saying with your actions and your activities? How are you living it out? How are you doing it? When transistor radios first came on the market, I was working in a place we sold those, sold them by the train load actually, and uh, and we serviced them. And just to make things, you know, interesting, we always kept one playing on the counter. Now, some of you folks that are old enough to know this, you remember the old tube radios? When you picked them up and rolled them over, they almost always cut out. And if you twist them a little bit, um, the antenna wasn't right, so it wouldn't pick up. But the transistor came out with a built-in antenna, and it didn't matter how you turned it, it kept on playing. So I had one on the counter. I was working with a guy one day. He came in, and he picked it up, and I had it tuned in to, uh, to the Christian station in town, and pretty quietly, but at that time you could do that. Nobody would get on your case about it. And uh, he picked it up, and he's turning it around, upside down, and all these kind of things. And, and I thought he was going to say, that's really interesting, isn't it? And he said, back down, and he said, that's a great song, isn't it? And I thought, what a neat way to say, I like the things that point me to Christ. What are we doing that points us to Christ? What are we doing that points us to Christ? Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we... Uh, thank you today for the gospel. I thank you for that believing record, Mary, Joseph, Zacharias, Elizabeth, the shepherds. Thank you, God, for all those people that are around the cross, around, around the birth of Christ. I thank you that you were working through them because they, they wanted to have a fellowship with you. They were praying for your coming. They were anxious to see you. They're anxious to know you. They were willing to be a part. So, Lord, I pray that you'll make us anxious to see you. I pray that you'll make us willing to be a part. That you'll work in our lives to become the people you want us to be. To honor you in the way that you want to be honored. To love you in the way you want to be loved. To be people of integrity. God, work in our lives. Give us the courage. Give us the grace and strength to be what you want us to be, and to worship you, and to praise you, and to be committed to you. God, we want to look for you, because we want you to look for us. And I ask you this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I worship you.
Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's a great day to say thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Praise your name, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Amen. We invite you down for some uh, refreshment, fellowship downstairs.